So you say, okay, we know we want to do a posterior fossa decompression. What are the things on the menu that we need to decide if we're going to do or not do? So the first question is really, are we going to open a dura? Because every posterior fossa decompression includes bone removal, C1 laminectomy, but then you can start to deviate. Do you just thin the dura and then you're done? Or do you move on to opening the dura? So there's obviously literature to try to answer some of these questions. The questions are not definitively answered yet, but we're getting more and more data as time goes on. So this is just a couple of examples, one single center study, one meta-analysis. And what they basically found was that if you have a syrinx, the syrinx is more likely to respond more quickly and probably more completely. So it's more likely to resolve or get very small if you open the dura and do a duraplasty. That doesn't mean the symptoms are necessarily gonna respond better. It just means the pictures are gonna look better. And that's an important distinction. Sometimes that really matters. Sometimes it probably doesn't. And so that's where some of the, the tougher questions are. So in both of these papers, they basically said, if you've got a syrinx, we'd probably lean towards doing a duraplasty. In the meta-analysis, the paper on the right, what they said is if you don't have a syrinx, we would probably lean towards not doing a duraplasty in order to avoid the risk of CSF leak or other complications that can happen when you open the dura. Because a dura is like a big water balloon, it's under some pressure, you create a weak spot in it by opening it and sewing it shut, and you can have complications as a result of that. The paper on the left, which is from Seattle, found that there weren't really that much in the way of complications, so they didn't worry about it too much. But the meta-analysis from multiple different sites showed that there could be complications, and so those are best avoided if you can avoid them. These are a couple of other papers that look at similar questions. The one on the left is an older meta-analysis, but I think that it did a really nice job, I think, of sort of laying the groundwork for decision-making for a number of years. And what they, what they found was that if you do a duraplasty, you're more likely to solve the patient's symptoms, to solve their problems, so you probably don't need to re-op very often. However, if you don't do the duraplasty, you're less likely to have complications. So that increased rate of solving the problem also comes with basically an equivalently increased rate of complications that can require you to go back in to do something to solve that problem. So it's a little bit of, you know, choose, choose what you want. Do you want to have to go back to operate because the symptoms aren't better? So you got to redo the surgery or do you want to have to go back to operate to treat a complication because you have a CSF leak or something around that? And that's really, you know, both of those occurred in somewhere in the like 10 to 12% range. So you really had very similar numbers and you were just sort of deciding which way you wanted to go. And importantly, the clinical improvement of the patients was more or less the same, regardless of which approach you used up front. So there was clearly an issue, and this was early on, um, there's clearly an issue in terms of defining, well, who's more likely to have a problem if you do a dural opening? So who can you avoid it in? Or who do you really need to take that risk in because they're not going to get better if you don't open the dura? And we really didn't have answers to any of those types of questions when this paper came out. This, again, was a meta-analysis of the data from 2008. We're starting to get some of that information now. So where some of that information is coming from is Park Reeves, which I mentioned before. So the paper on the right was basically their initial effort looking to see what correlates with syrinx size. And in that paper, what they basically showed is that uh, that age, and that if you have a duraplasty, you're more likely, again, to have a rapid decrease in the size of your syrinx. That doesn't necessarily mean that you're clinically going to do better. And what they said is, we just need to wait for a randomized trial. And lo and behold, they were finishing a randomized trial at the time. So we just finished this study last year, um, and now we're just doing the follow-up, and then you know we'll write it up, and, um, and we'll see what the data show. So we don't have the answer to who is most likely to do okay if you don't open the dura versus who do you need to open the dura for? But those data are hopefully coming along in the next couple of years. I think we have to do one year follow-up on each patient before we can uh, analyze the data there. So let's just say you decide, okay, I'm gonna open the dura. What do I do after that? Do I just open it and look in there and then sew in my patch? Or do I open it and do some kind of additional maneuvers? So some intradural activity. And historically, there have been a number of things that people have done. They've done things like um, put a stent from the posterior fossa to the subarachnoid space. They put stents directly into syrinxes. They have tried to plug up the uh, central canal, thinking that syrinx came down from the fourth ventricle into the central canal. People have gotten away from almost all of those things as first-line therapy. We still sometimes will use a stent from the fourth ventricle to the subarachnoid space as like third-line therapy. But 
uh, one thing that people still do, and, and I still do fairly routinely, is explore to make sure you see good fluid flow coming across the obex. So what you want to know is that CSF is able to make it from the intraventricular space in the fourth ventricle out into the cervical subarachnoid space and wash back and forth across the frame and magnum. And so all you really need to do in order to verify that is separate the tonsils and look and see. And the reason that this paper is important, and this is a paper that came out of Alabama, is they found that in 12% of their kids, when they looked, there was actually a thin veil of arachnoid that was blocking the fluid from getting out. So even if you just opened the dura and sewed it back shut, you still wouldn't have solved the problem in those kids. And interestingly, it was about 10 or 12% of kids who had a uh, dural sparing, right? So it didn't open the dura operation who failed and had to go back for another surgery. So the question is, are those the kids who correlated with the ones who had arachnoid veils in the fourth ventricle? So you got to open that up and see it and take care of it. And so this is, you know, just my personal opinion is if you're going to open the dura, look in there, make sure that there's good CSF flow in and out of there so that you know you've solved that problem. And then if you want, you can heat the tonsils from the outside a little bit and shrink them up to make that space bigger, hopefully to make it less likely that you're going to have some kind of scar formation or something that is going to close that space up again. But that's again, an, another choice. So my feeling is if you're going to open the dura, at least take a look and make sure you've got good fluid flow coming out of there. So you said, okay, we're opening the dura. We're going to make sure there's good fluid flow. Now what are we going to do? We got to close the dura, right? And so generally speaking, people don't do a primary dural closure. You know, they don't just sew the dura back shut again because the whole object of the surgery is to establish more space there. So you need to try and sew in a patch or something to increase the space. So, okay, I'm gonna sew in a patch. Well, what kind of patch am I gonna use? You know, am, I gonna, am I just gonna like take my shirt and sew it in there? Like, of course not, right? So you gotta think about what kind of patch. So you've got broadly two categories. You've got autograft, so the patient's own tissue, and you've got everything else. So allograft, and allograft can come from a number of sources. It can be animal tissue that's been processed. It can be purely synthetic things. Um, so, <clears throat> People have looked at success rates using all these different materials to try to figure out what's the best thing to use because there's obviously pros and cons of anything. So this is another Park Reefs paper that um, we just published this year. And basically what it showed is that the total complication rates using either autograft, so a patient's own tissue, most commonly that's pericranium. So you make an additional incision just above your surgical incision and take a piece of pericranium, bring it down, sew it in. So comparing that to using anything else, the overall complication rate was equivalent. However, there was a significant difference in terms of pseudomeningocele, so collection of fluid under the skin, and chemical meningitis. That's basically an inflammatory process where the body has a response to whatever tissue you put in there. So it's not surprising that when you take a patient's own tissue and you just move it around, their body's not gonna have a problem with that. But when you bring in something off the shelf that's a total foreign body, and you sew it in there, some people's bodies are not gonna to take too well to that and they're gonna have a big inflammatory response. And it turns out that inflammatory response can be really miserable. It can prolong time in the hospital. It can sometimes require additional surgeries and it can just make the process kind of awful. So chemical meningitis, pseudomeningocele, those are things that if you can avoid them, it's definitely worth avoiding. So in my practice, uh, we only use pericranial autograph unless for some reason we can't. And it's largely because of that specific thing. So that was one of the findings of this paper. Then they, uh, we also took a look at different non-autografts. So there's bovine pericardium, as I mentioned, there's just sort of a collagen graft. And these are different brands basically of, of, of uh, off-the-shelf grafts. There's purely synthetic things. And what was found there was that the bovine pericardial grafts were actually pretty good. They didn't cause a lot of issues with regard to pseudomeningocele, CSF leaks, chemical meningitis. But when you got into some of those other things, that's really where you started to see those problems happen. So that's really useful because it gives us guidance as to what are we going to put in the patient to, you know, to create that patch that's going to minimize the risk that they're going to have some kind of complication or difficulty. So this gets into kind of that last thing about what operation are you going to do? So Atul Goel is a very well-known, really well-respected uh, neurosurgeon in India, and he does a lot of complex craniocervical work. He does a lot of 
upper cervical fusions. And he posited in 2015 that actually all Chiari's are in fact just the body's response to some kind of occult instability at C1, C2. And therefore every patient with a Chiari should not have a posterior fossa decompression, but instead should have a C1, 2 fusion. So for people who aren't totally familiar with that, you know, that's a great operation when you need it. But first of all, you're fusing two bones together. You decrease range of motion a little bit. You're putting the vertebral arteries at risk. You're putting the spinal cord at risk because you're passing screws right next to them. So in, in my hands, while that's a great operation, I feel that it's a little bit of higher risk operation than a posterior fossa decompression. And you're taking away uh, somebody's range of motion. So uh, to me, you know, I, I feel like it's, it's a safer better long-term option to use a posterior fossa decompression if you can. And there was a, a very sort of uh, exuberant response from the pediatric neurosurgery community to this concept, basically saying, we don't think this is the case. We do not think it's appropriate to do C12 fusions on every kid who has a Chiari. We think it's unsafe and we're not doing it. So <clears throat> while I thought it was important to mention the fact that there are alternative you know, perspectives and ideas on how to treat Chiari, by and large, uh, the majority of the pediatric neurosurgery community treats them with some form of posterior fossa decompression uh, at this stage of the game. Hey everyone, Ryan Rad here from neurosurgerytraining.org. If you like that video, subscribe and donate to keep our content available for medical students across the world.